Hello everyone. I hope and pray that this video is going to be a blessing to you. And uh, I think it's interesting um, and filled with biblical um, support. So uh, please bear with me until the end. Uh, it will get probably more interesting towards the end uh, for some, but you need also the, uh, the foundation that I lay in the beginning. Um, before I, I start off, I want to say that we are not trying to set dates, um, although there is nothing wrong uh, with expectation. Uh, we are eagerly awaiting the home taking, and we watch with great anticipation. And we are watching and we are being ready, and we are trying to understand the signs and the times, as we are instructed to do. And they are not given to us in vain. So, as we are uh, on the cusp of the Day of Atonement, I want to speak about it. And what does it mean? Where, what does it point to, in particular, with regards to the rapture and or the second coming of Jesus Christ? And I want to read first from Leviticus uh, 23, verses 27 through 31, where the feast is uh, declared by God. Um, there it says, Also on the tenth day of this seventh month there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And you shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. So this is another one of these feasts that is hardly known nor celebrated by most Christians. Sure, Jesus atoned for our sins and so it has been fulfilled, one could argue, and so we don't need to keep it anymore. But that then would also apply to Passover. In fact, we know that Jesus' death and resurrection, um, with it the feast uh, of Passover, unleavened bread, the feast of first fruits and uh, the Day of Atonement have all been fulfilled um, in that. Uh, the former three, even on the exact same day or date. So the Day of Atonement um, is of all these uh, probably least uh, clear to most Christians. This day, uh, also known as Yom Kippur or Yom Kippurim in plural, is the most important feast on the Jewish calendar for the Jewish people. It's the holiest day in the year. So what is it about and why would it be relevant to us? As I pointed out in the previous uh, videos about Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, uh, the feasts are rehearsals for appointed or designated times. So what does it point to? Except then of course the already fulfilled atonement. Originally, as described in Leviticus 16, the high priest would present two identical goats. One would be sacrificed for atonement, and the other one, the scapegoat, would be sent away into the wilderness, carrying the sins. And this was fulfilled by uh, Pilate, the Roman governor, when he presented Jesus Barabbas, Barabbas meaning son of the father, and Jesus Christ, Son of the Heavenly Father, both named Jesus and one reflecting in the name what the other was um, as being the Son of God. Uh, so you can say, in a way, identical um, goats that the priest presented, Pilate here playing the role of the priest. Um, but ultimately, both roles were fulfilled by Jesus, both of the sacrificial lamb and of the scapegoat. Now, the priest, after having presented these and after the people would have chosen which goat would be which, the priest would then go into the holy sanctuary 
to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, and so to atone for the sins. And the people would wait outside with great anticipation for the high priest to reappear, because that would mean reconciliation had taken place. Hebrews 9.11 tells us that Jesus is our eternal high priest. After being both a sacrificial lamb and the scapegoat, he also fulfills the role of the high priest and went into the Holy of Holiest, which is a type of heaven, where he is now at the right hand of the Father, um, intervening uh, or mediating for our uh, sake. And this we can read in Hebrews 9 verse 15. So now we wait with great anticipation for our eternal high priest to reappear from the Holy of Holiest, as it were, and that part is yet un unfulfilled, and it is linked to the second coming of Jesus, not to the rapture. After all, it is a return, it is a reappearing of the high priest. It is an event described in Matthew 24, uh, verses 30 and 31, and I want to read those. It says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall the tribes, all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they, they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Uh, it is accompanied by a great trumpet. Uh, in Greek it says me Megalis Salpigos, which means great trumpet. Uh, or in Hebrew it, this is Tekia Hagadol, the great trumpet, which should not be confused by the last trumpet, Tekia Hagadola. Uh, the timing of this event is also clear. And actually, in the verse preceding what I just read, Matthew 24, verse 29, it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days. So this is at the end of the tribulation, immediately at the end. Um, and we can also, of course, get this from Revelation 19, verse 11. This is the second coming, for, for and this uh, event is foreshadowed by Moses when he came down from the mountain for the second time, after the first time he uh, he threw the um, the stone tables with the, the law and, and broke them um, when he saw the people worshipping the golden calf. And he went up a second time and when he returned the second time, that was on Tishri 10, the, the tenth of the seventh month. And um, that is the day that we now know as Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. That's when he descended from Mount Sinai foreshadowing Jesus coming uh, for the second time, as it were with the law for judgment. And the timeline um, that um, I'm showing here uh, can be uh, found on the website and downloaded. I will leave a link for that in the description. The people uh, knew when Moses came from the mountain that after the sins they had committed that now reconciliation, atonement had been accomplished. Now Revelation 19 verse 14 and Jude verse 14 and Zechariah 14 verse 5 all describe that he will return with his saints. The saints must have gone, gone up prior to that. And we pointed out before that is prior to the tribulation period. The full, future fulfillment of Yom Kippur is the second coming of Jesus with his saints and the feast is a rehearsal for that designated time as well as a constant reminder of our reconciliation with God through Christ. Now as I pointed out in a prior trumpet alert, the chief rabbis have determined that the new year that has just begun on Rosh Hashanah is a jubilee. This means that it is the 50th year after seven cycles of seven years. And it is therewith also the first year of a new seven-year cycle, also called a Shemitah. Now Jewish mystics, for what it's worth, uh, have predicted that it will be uh, seven years with much war and uh, turmoil, and with the coming of the Messiah. 
sounds a lot like the seven year tribulation period. But there's something special about the Jubilee. And we read that in uh, Leviticus 25, verses 8 and 9. And there it says, And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of, of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. In other words, the Jubilee does not officially start at Rosh Hashanah, but ten days later on Yom Kippur. And it is proclaimed by blowing the trumpets throughout the land. An extra last trumpet, if you will. Ten days after the Feast of Trumpets. And this happens only once every 50 years. So it's quite unique. Just before the flood, going back now to Genesis, just before the flood of Noah, uh, in Noah's days, God made the following statement in Genesis 6 verse 3. He said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. Now this statement has two levels. The obvious one, namely that man would not grow older than 120 years, which from that point on practically without exception was so. But the deeper meaning is to read instead of man, mankind. In Hebrew it's the same word, Adam. And for years we could read uh, Jubilee years. And if you read it that way, then it means that God would end his strife with mankind after 6,000 years. 120 Jubilees is 6,000 years. And that's a point in time where we have come, as I believe. Jesus was uh, born in the year 4000 AM, Anno Mundi, since creation. And in Jesus' days, this was known. And even before he was born, it was known to uh, the, the Jewish scribes that the Messiah would, would be born in the year 4000. But uh, we know the biblical narrative and they denied uh, that Jesus was the Messiah and Actually, 135 years later, they changed the calendar, and that's why we are now off by a few hundred years. Um, so also there is a timeline that I will put the link for uh, in the description. So if this is indeed a jubilee year, then it stands to reason that it is the 120th, given all the other signs. We, we can be a year off, but not 50 years. And there's another specific characteristic about the Jubilee. Again, in uh, Leviticus 25, in verse 10 and verse 13, it says, And you shall hallow the 50th year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a Jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man unto his possession, and you shall return every man unto his family. In the year of this jubilee you shall return every man unto his possession. Every man is returned to his family. This pertains to bond servants. And possessions, meaning real estate, land and, and buildings, uh, possessions are returned to the original owner. Now as we have been adopted into the family of God, we will return to our heavenly family on this final jubilee when all possessions return and all the servants return to their families. We will return to our or turn to our heavenly family. In Romans 8 verse 23 it says, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit the redemption of our body. Here it gives this adoption into the family, uh, that we will witness it, um, and the redemption of our body. And that sounds a lot of the change of the corruptible into the incorruptible that Paul also speaks of in 1 Corinthians 15. And we know that it speaks about the rapture. 
and the return of real estate is also applicable. When God created man, he gave him dominion over that entire piece of real estate called the earth that we can read in Genesis 1 verse 28. That real estate, the earth, will be returned to God, the original and rightful owner. Also this we read in Romans 8 as well as in Revelation 20. So the characteristic of the, of the Jubilee uh, apply to, to God, specifically uh, with regards to the final Jubilee, the 120th Jubilee. So if the seven year tribulation begins exactly when the rapture takes place, and if it ends with the second coming of Jesus, which it does according to Revelation 19 and Zechariah 14, then we see something peculiar. In the video about Yom Teruah, I explained that the great trumpet, the Tekia Hagadol, is linked to the second coming. This is traditionally so, and it is confirmed by Matthew 24 verses 30 and 31 as we just read. So if the tribulation ends on Yom Kippur, and it starts exactly seven year years earlier, 2520 days, then it also starts on Yom Kippur. And if that coincides with the rapture, the last trumpet is blown, the Tekiah Gedola. It brings, as it were, the last trumpet and the great trumpet together. And that reminds of what uh, James wrote in James 5, verse uh, 7 and 8. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waited for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and the latter rain. The former and the latter rain are both mentioned here, and they are appointed times. We know that, uh, among other verses from Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah 5, verse 24, there it says, Neither say they in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God that giveth rain, both the former and the latter, in his season. He reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. It speaks here about season, which is in Hebrew, Moad, it's an appointed time, but also the appointed weeks of the harvest, and the harvest is the rapture. Joel speaks about these same uh, early and latter rains as well and links it to the first month in Joel 2 verse 23. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And that's very interesting because the, the, the latter rain falls in spring um, and we have there the first month of the holy year, the month of Nisan, the month in which we have Passover. And the latter rain, um, sorry, in the, the, the former rain falls in autumn eh, on the first month of the civil new year, uh, Rosh Hashanah, the month in which we have um, Yom Kippur the month of Tishri. So the link between uh, spring and autumn um, is, is clear here. <coughs> and this links uh, the two feasts of Passover and Yom Kippur. We have also seen this in uh, the tabernacle as we did an in-depth study about that. The first item uh, is the altar of burnt offering and it points to the cross, the sacrifice, to Passover. It's the first feast in spring. And the last item into, in the tabernacle is the uh, Ark of the Covenant, all the way into the Holy of Holiest. And it's the sixth item. And it points to atonement, to Yom Kippur, the sixth feast in autumn. And these two are physically linked by, di by their dimensions. Uh, we've shown that uh, back then. And... Um, it points respectively to the earth, and the foot of the cross was planted in the earth, and to heaven, the top of the cross pointing to heaven, and bridging those two. So they really come together. It will be a complete fulfillment of everything. 
the gate to paradise, as it were, shall be opened again. Remember that God closed that gate, um, which is on the east of the garden. In Genesis 3 verse 24 it says, So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way, to keep the way of the tree of life. For 6,000 years it remained closed, six prophetic days, but then it shall be opened on the seventh day, the Sabbath. And Ezekiel 46 speaks about that in verse 1. It says, Thus saith the Lord, the gate of the inner court that looketh toward the east shall be shut, the six working days. But on the Sabbath it shall be opened, and in the day of the new moon it shall be opened opened. The new moon points to Yom Teruah, Rosh Hashanah. It's the only feast that is on a new moon. Therefore, the day or the hour is not known. Yom Kippur begins seven days after Yom Teruah has ended. And it's like a reversal of the closing of the door of the Ark uh, of Noah. Now it speaks about opening a door, but the closing of the door was seven days prior to the flood. So we see many signs, parallels, indications that um, show that it is very possible that Yom Kippur will not only be the day of the second coming of Jesus, but actually also the day of the home taking of the church, also known as the rapture. Um, it remains to be seen, but I think there is very much um, to to think about um, if we read all these verses and put things together. We live in exciting times, uh, and we see that um, Scripture is full of exciting mysteries that we um, we are to study and to think about. And if um, if the Spirit is uh, dwelling in you, you will have this yearning. The spirit and the bride say, come. And um, I mentioned this also in previous video. Moses said it already. We can read this in Psalm 90. Return, O Lord, how long? And Jesus answers in Revelation 22. Surely I come quickly. Amen. Amen.